This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow Cookie to Range, the podcast of me, Sarah Raven, and various different guests. And today, I'm actually joined by two very distinguished gentlemen. One is my husband, Adam Nicholson, and the other is Steve Head. Basically, he runs something called the Wildlife Gardening Forum, and he is a sort of biodiversity expert, I guess, but very, very much with the garden at his heart. He knows more than anyone I've come across about how we can make our own little patches, not just good for us and lovely to be in, but also good for biodiversity. Welcome, Steve. Hello. Nice to be with you, Sarah. And welcome, Adam. Thank you for having me. So how we thought we'd do, we're going to do a pair of podcasts. And the first one I'm going to lead and Adam might interject, and that's going to be on with Steve on gardening and biodiversity. And the second one, Adam's going to lead and I might interject, I might not, and that's going to be on the importance of ponds. And they go together, these two, and Steve's going to be with us for both because Adam, uh, the reason I want him to lead it is that he's actually – on the farm, putting ponds in. And one of the things I'm sure we'll touch on in the gardening section with Steve is how unbelievably important even just a bird bath or a shallow saucer, literally, for insects to be able to drink in without drowning is. And and then taking it in, and Adam will take it on to ponds, either large or small, and how fundamentally important they are for biodiversity. But Steve is our coach and Steve is our leader. And we follow everything that Steve tells us to do. (laughs) (laughs) Very unwise, but never mind. (laughs) Actually, probably not quite true, but almost. Anyway, so I wanted to to start by explaining how I met Steve. So I made a program called Bees, Butterflies and Blooms 15 or 16 years ago with the BBC. And it was one of those programs they used to do. Well, they still do a bit, which was a one hour or perhaps three one hours of taking a one subject and really looking into it in depth. And mine was about pollinators and the decline of pollinators. And one of the experts that I went to visit and then came to visit here at Perch Hill was Steve. And he basically did a sort of baseline audit of the garden here in terms of pollinators, both moths and butterflies, bees and hoverflies, but also small mammals, invertebrates of all types. And we had a great time. Anyway, he came back 15 years later. So he came back this summer and we reconnected and he did a, an audit again. But the thing, I'm talking too much as usual, but I suppose podcasts are about talking. But um, I, I must, it's Steve's show, not mine. But I really want to explain that I had this fantastic eureka moment when Steve was giving us a talk and he put this graph up on the slideshow, which on one axis, it has biodiversity in a garden setting. And on the other axis, it had years. And basically what, what happens when you make a garden, if you have, you take up your astroturf, please take up your astroturf. Oh, agreed. And you have bare soil beneath it. What happens in time, so in the first year, is you get this totally almost vertical cliff of biodiversity blossoming in your garden because of plant types. So basically the weeds lead the way or whatever plants you put in, whatever it is, and you just get this absolutely, well, almost vertical line. And then if you stop gardening or stop plowing your field or whatever, gradually what happens is that the biodiversity over time comes right down to about 10% of where it was at the peak. And the eureka moment for me was if you garden, 
and we will put this graph in the podcast notes if I'm not describing it well enough. If you garden, you stay almost at the peak of the peak because you are intervening the whole time in a positive sense of adding new plants, adding different habitats, growing a huge range of different things, which is even better than in the countryside. So gardening, in fact, and that's Steve's whole thing, is unbelievably good for biodiversity. More than a wood, more than a field, more than an old meadow, gardens and us all joining together are the places where biodiversity is at its richest. Is that right, Steve? Yes, largely speaking. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons why gardens are really biodiverse. And I have to say that you're at fault for some of it because you are selling lots of plants to people and people are saying, wow, let's go to Sarah Raven and buy this wonderful plant. And they're putting it into their garden. So you're helping gardeners to contrive biodiversity by having a really good variety of plants in the garden. And that's probably as much as anything the reason gardens are so good. Another reason is that you cram into a small space all kinds of bits of structure. So you've got uh, shrubs and perennials and trees and lots of vertical space. And that's enormously important. It's one of the reasons why gardens are so much better than meadows, for instance. Mm. But going back to your main point, this one about this, this curve, essentially what the curve was demonstrating is what's called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis in ecology. And that is that when you start off with bare ground, by definition, there's nothing living there. But things come in and colonize really pretty quickly. And after two or three years, you've got lots and lots of species in there, but some of them are beginning to dominate. And after a little while, the actual number of species goes down because some species are highly dominant. And you only have to think of things like nettles and brambles and ivy, which are so familiar in the garden. If you turn your back for five minutes, they're coming up and covering everything else. Now, if you don't intervene, these plants, plus a few small trees coming in eventually, will depress almost everything else. And as well as depressing the plants, that then limits the number of animals which can live in there. But along comes a gardener. My old dad used to wander around the garden and he'd see a plant that was doing really well. And he'd say, oh, I'm going to have to take that out. It's going to take over. <laughs> and in a kind of way, that's exactly what gardeners do. Because mm -hmm. if something is becoming too dominant for what you want, you cut it back a bit. You might even take it out completely. But basically, you make sure that nothing really comes to dominate. And I think it's this continual disturbance that you're doing certainly coupled up with the fact that you do some pretty total disturbance on things like vegetable patches. They go back to bare earth practically every year. That means that you've always got space for the weeds and the rapidly growing species to grow up, as well as the more long established ones. And this is a pretty standard concept in ecology. And it's high time we began to realise that that's essentially what gardeners are doing. Yes. It's so interesting, this, because... I wrote a book a couple of years ago about life on the shore, on the intertidal. Yep. And at the head of a bay where there was really next to no disturbance, it was very, very low in biodiversity. Lots of kelp, presumably, and things exactly. like that. And right out on the headland where the storms came and hit very hard, there was also rather low biodiversity because things were being smashed off the whole time. And exactly in the intermediate disturbance zone, halfway between the two, was where life was most various and most kind of dynamically alive and self-replacing, constantly self-replacing. And that's exactly exactly the model you're talking about, isn't it? Really? It is indeed. And I cut my teeth as an ecologist working on coral reefs and very much the same thing happens there when you get occasional storms coming. You get lots of space created for other things to come in. And that's one of the reasons why coral reefs are very diverse. But not too much. That's the point, isn't it? Not too much. Oh, well, that's much. An intermediate level. Yes, yeah. yes. But a, a more extreme but very important example is the finbos in uh, South Africa, uh, yeah. which is yeah, yeah. really one of the most biodiverse and fabulous places you go to. It's full of beautiful plants. But it's actually 
essential that it burns naturally once every few years. And after it's burnt, you look at it and you think nothing's going to grow here again. But then you look harder and you can already see the sprouts of things coming up to uh, replace what's been missing. And mm. again, intermediate level of disturbance. So that's really what gardens are good at. But, it, but, but this is also about kind of no dig, isn't it? Because presumably if you really do absolutely trash in these terms, uh, a vegetable patch, then that is the equivalent of a really major storm coming in and ridding that little bit uh, of everything, isn't it? I mean... What mycorrhizae you mean? Yes, for example, you know, that, that the whole thing that uh, the rewilders talk about is how incredibly destructive ploughing is mm. and uh, completely kind of removing the kind of that basis of soil life. And what, what what do you say about that, Stephen? Well, I, the truth as ever lies in between two extremes. Mm. When you're talking about a field of several hectares and ploughing it regularly every year, then you're turning that into something wholly artificial. But let's look at it another way. If you're digging up your garden every now and then for the vegetable patch, yes, you are disturbing the ground communities. You're turning it over. You are mucking about a bit with the... Uh, fungi, for example, your, uh, your mice eats in the, in the ground. But what you're also doing is bringing the seed bank to the surface. Now, a lot of plants, seeds are adapted to live almost indefinitely in, in the soil. Poppies are the very best example of that, which is why, of course, when the ground in the First World War was blown to pieces by shells, it was poppies that came back in huge quantities, which is why we celebrate them now. So <laughs> if you certainly don't need to dig anything like as much as the old advice used to give. You're much better off not digging and putting a mulch of some sort on the surface, which the worms can bring in. But having said that, a certain amount of digging isn't that destructive that you're going to wreck your garden's ecology. It isn't. So the truth is between the two extremes. And I think it's incredibly important to, in a way, reassure people that what we're, what you're suggesting here doesn't need to be a weed patch. You know, it can be a really beautiful, abundant, <sighs> floriferous, productive, exceptionally idyllic place like Eden. Yeah, there's, there's certainly a, a crucial thing here. You often hear people, particularly, dare I say, some telepundits who talk about this is my wildlife garden patch. Mm, and mm. they've got a, a big garden and there's a few square feet of it, which they planted, I don't know, whatever on, and they say this is for wildlife. Wildlife doesn't know that you've done that. The wildlife will be there over the whole garden. And the great thing is that wildlife loves what people do in most gardens, which is why, as I think you hinted, Sarah, gardens are more biodiverse than other British habitats. Yeah. In fact, they're more biodiverse than quite a few tropical habitats as well. And it's partly through disturbance because also we're putting in lots and lots of species and we're crowding stuff in together. Now, it's true that gardens won't have some of the really, really rare species, but that's simply because the really rare species require very special habitat, um, like the um, purple emperor butterfly requires very tall trees in a forest. You're not going to get that in your garden unless you're the Duke of Westminster, perhaps. Yeah. But for, for general, for the they sort like of young ecology, sallow. They like young sallows as well. Yeah. The, anyway, the, I wish we could get them in the garden, uh, but I'm not going to go planting sallows just for that. I'll be planting sallows because they're actually really good for all kinds of moths as well. Yes, and I think that we're myth busting here, which I really like. There's a sort of preconception that if you want to garden for biodiversity and particularly for pollinators and birds, you've got to grow only our native species. And that's complete rubbish, isn't it, Steve? Yeah, generally speaking, yes. And it does depend what you're concerned about. If you're concerned about birds, I really don't think there's much wrong with growing pretty much whatever you like in the garden. Hmm. What birds are looking for is structure so that they can build nests or hide away and they're looking for food. And of course, during the, the season of bringing up their young, they're mainly looking for insects rather than plants to feed on. And one thing we do know is that gardens are really good for uh, producing high quantities of insects. During the winter, of course, birds love seeds and they love fruit. And 
Yeah. There's no reason why non-native varieties of, um, of seeds and fruit should be any worse or any better for that matter than the native ones. However, when you come to pollinators, um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's two sides of a sword. A few species, and unfortunately, most of our butterflies are actually quite limited in what they will take as caterpillars. Yes. So, for example, the orange tip butterfly has a very specific requirement. You know, I've forgotten instantly what it was that it eats. It's cardamony, isn't it? It's cooking That's flour. Right. And th- th- it used to be say- said, if you were chasing uh, an orange tip butterfly and it got away from your net, you'd say, oh, cardamony. <laughs> because that was their sort of way of letting off steam. Um, yeah, so that's an example. The butterflies need food plants for the caterpillars. Yeah. Now, cardamine or cardamine is actually a plant that looks pretty good in a garden, so I think that's one I would encourage people to plant. But that's one side. It's the caterpillars. The other side, of course, is the pollinators, that their requirement for nectar, in particular in the case of butterflies. Mm-hmm. And there's very little evidence that native plants are better in any real way for pollinators than are the related ones that come from overseas. Exotics, yeah. Yeah, with exotics, and there's another category which we've started calling near natives. Now, I'm sure you're aware of this, Sarah, but we've got an absolutely rubbish flora in Britain. We've mm. only got about 1,600 species, I think, of, of plants in this country, 1,625. We've actually got nearly 1,800 species, which are quite happily living in the countryside, which are all non-native, which have been introduced at one time or another. Only a handful of these are really any problem at all. And they're all providing resources for insects. But of course, if you then add in the horticultural ones, and you mentioned the exotics. As far as I'm concerned, these are ones that probably would have lived in the southern hemisphere. And many of these actually flower very late in the year. Um, mm. I mean, you're a great dahlias. expert on dahl- uh, dahlias. <laughs> yes, of course. I was just going to say dahlias. A classic example. They flower late and they provide resources uh, at a time where there is much less otherwise available. You know, the ice plant, Hylotophilifium. I can never pronounce that properly. Uh, what used to be Sedum spectabile, mm. um, that's a non native and it's a really good plant. The thing about horticultural plants is that we choose them not because they've got funny names, but because they flower prolifically for a long time. Because that's mm. what you want in the garden. You don't really want something that opens for a day and then dies. And of course, that's what the insects like, because they've then got a huge number of flowers, uh, which will be available over long periods. So from the pollinator's point of view, the horticultural plants, most of them, that is, can be really good. Although, as you're equally aware, Sarah, um, some of the very highly bred varieties, particularly the doubles or flora plano types, yeah. actually are almost no use at all. But it's quite easy to avoid them. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I, I just wanted us to also mention Jennifer Owen, and and I mm. suppose, I mean, why we're talking about this is, as Steve always, it reminds me, half of our plants are under threat, one in six birds are under threat of extinction, one in three amphibia are also on the verge of extinction, and 80% of butterflies are declining and half are actually worse than that. They're also in danger of extinction. So that's why we're bothering. And the person who really has done the most sort of bottoming out of why gardens are so fantastically good is Jennifer Owen. Will you talk to us about her? I will, with great delight. Jennifer Owen is one of my longtime heroes stroke heroines. She's a very competent biologist, and she was living in a very ordinary house in Leicester, and decided it would be very interesting to see how many species she could find in the garden. And because she was very well connected with lots of other ecologists, she was able to collect specimens and send them to people, uh, so the ones that she couldn't identify herself, she could get identified. And over the course of a few years, she found and identified 2,200 species of insects in um, 34 different groups. Now, that's a very impressive total, and I doubt if many small nature reserves would have a species list as long as that. But that's only the beginning, because she could only look at about a quarter of the types of, of species which 
could occur in the garden. For example, she could do almost nothing with the flies except the hover flies. And on that basis, assuming, and this is a very legitimate assumption, that for the group she couldn't study, uh, a similar proportion of the British fauna would be found in the garden, then this is accepted as clear evidence for over 8,000 species mm. of insects alone that could and probably do occur from time to time in gardens. It's incredible, isn't it? Is that, is that because she gardened in a particularly insect-friendly way? Or was it that she, she was a really good looker? Well, I'm sure in her time she was quite a classic looker, but I'm, no, I know that's not <laughs> you know what you what mean. I mean yes, I do, Adam. Investigator. Um, it's a very good question because she started out to try to find what ordinary gardens have got in them. So she didn't read a book on wildlife gardening. To be honest, at that point, no such books really existed. What she did was study her ordinary garden. And the only concession she made, which is one that many gardeners make anyway, is that she refused to use pesticides in the garden. She didn't use things like insecticides. But that's a very standard choice for a lot of gardeners anyway. Otherwise, she just planted what she liked and what her neighbours are planting, so that as far as possible she had a normal garden which she could either uh, investigate. And yes, I have to say she's a very good looker for wildlife. And she ran all kinds of types of trap and so on, um, a moth trap, for example, and a thing called a malaise trap for small flying insects. And she did a thorough, excellent job. And hats off to her. Her two books about the garden are you know, absolutely fundamental background reading for anybody interested in garden wildlife. And did she look at uh, vertebrates as well? To a limited extent. But then <laughs> vertebrates are extremely limited in gardens. Now, I know you're keen on birds. And yes, she covered the birds pretty adequately. But otherwise, we've got really very few species of mammals, uh, amphibia and reptiles and so forth in gardens. And she recorded the ones that she saw. But when you've only got about half a dozen amphibia to play with, mm. it's very minor compared with the uh, with the insects but the insects of course are the food for everything else in the garden so you can't have amphibia and birds and so on if you haven't got the invertebrates i mean that's the point isn't it is it you know some of our listeners might be thinking well why why do i care about having 8000 insect species <laughs> Uh, well, the point is, <laughs> they may even be horrified by it, Sarah. They well, might you, get, you get you get bitten go, by them. They go buzz. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. stung. Yeah. Adam is actually allergic to me. But the, that's what we need to kind of really explain: is they are at the bottom of the ecosystem, and you know, above them is the next layer, which is, well, you know, you explain, Steve, but but with that richness goes richness is the point, isn't it? Absolutely. Above the level of the insects, you've got more insects. It's actually the level of the herbivore insects and then the carnivore insects above them. And then the small carnivores, like small birds and small mammals and mm. frogs and so on above that. And then, of course, the bigger carnivores, which will eat these. So you've got what's called a food web. Yeah. And one of the interesting things about gardens is the complexity of the food webs we have there because we have so many different kinds of plant and different kinds of fruit tree and so on. Mm. And you get these wonderful interlocking food webs where one thing lives on another and another thing eats it. Yes, good. Well, I guess that, you know, in a way, I think we can almost wrap up with that, which is I'm afraid I'm – obsessed by my graph or rather your graph and yeah. my my eureka moment but the point is that biodiversity isn't just a word for the classroom biodiversity is a way of enriching all our lives and as gardeners we are in an incredibly important and precious position to enhance it and to make the biodiversity of the world a better place by us all having a call to arms to really think about it in 2024. And Adam wants to say something. He's putting his hand up. He is, because this is a brilliant message to have. And is it essentially you can do anything except use poisons? Is that the heart of this? Anything you like except poisons? Well, yes, but there's a lot of things that you might want to do which probably don't help very much. And one thing would be regularly mowing your lawn and 
eliminating as far as you can weeds within the lawn. That sort of thing is 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 counterproductive. But beyond that, having an excessively tidy garden where, for example, you cut all the seed heads off before the birds can get at them, that's something else to avoid doing. Mm. But the bottom line is that almost any garden is going to be better than almost any patch of conventionally managed farmland or countryside today because it's got space for wildlife to coexist. So let's build houses on the green belt, eh? <laughs> well, you know, funny to say that. It has been suggested by people who know what they're talking about that the best thing to do with an intensive arable field is to build a housing estate on top of it. Yeah. Because that way you'll end up with some gardens that wish they were bigger and you'll probably get more species in the long term than if you just carried on chucking on fertiliser and taking off wheat. And people could afford a house. But the thing <laughs> is that, <laughs> you know, AstroTurf has to be banned. So uh, Steve and I are uh, slightly beginning to work on a project in central London where we're going to link gardens and back gardens to churchyards and common spaces, but very much in an urban environment. But the point is there has to be some baseline rules. No AstroTurf has to be one of them. <laughs> having regular water throughout has to be another. Ideally having hedges, not fences or walls, so things yes. like hedgehogs. So anyway, all and, this. And a conscious diversity in the street. That yes. was what that great Bristol experiment was, that they could design the entire row of back gardens as a hugely structurally and botanically diverse place yeah 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 i'd say this is a, a real characteristic of gardens in the landscape that no two gardens are the same mm. whereas two fields of wheat do tend to be yeah. very similar mm. yeah. and the diversity of gardens is it's a thing to triumph yes. which is also why i will always say there is no standard blueprint for a wildlife garden yeah. and so people who have particular interests and wishes i'd say go ahead and do it yeah your own taste in tree in climber in perennial in shrub in annual in bulb and in grassland everybody follow their nose and have their own choices think about singles not doubles ideally with flowers i suppose definitely and watch things to see if they're visited by butterflies and bees and if they are get more of them I think you've just touched on the best possible definition of a wildlife gardener. A wildlife gardener is somebody who looks at their garden and sees what's going on and thinks about it and tries to help. Excellent. That's a very good note to end on. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure. Thanks for listening to Grow Cook Eat Arrange with Steve Head, who's our biodiversity expert and I learn so much for him every time I chat to him where he comes to Perch Hill. I also learn lots from Josie Lewis who's a head gardener here at Perch. She's with me next week and we're going to talk about winter gardening in the sense of not kind of the jobs that you do but the things to be aware of and think of if it's really frosty snowy or perhaps torrential rain which is a thing that we're getting more and more aren't we so just the things to be aware of to protect your garden against the absolute extraordinary fluctuations of weather that we increasingly get You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.